Kitchen for the 1981 Institute of National Affairs. Uh, before I start, I'd like to remind you that the Institute will be continuing through Friday. As a matter of fact, we do have speakers tomorrow that should be of interest. Leo Pfeffer will speak tomorrow evening on religion and law under Reagan. Tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock in the Memorial Union, Raymond DeLosto, former chief counsel for the Wisconsin Civil Liberties Union, will speak on the role of state appellate courts in the Berger era. Tonight, as you're aware of, um, we have Mr. Ramsey Clark to speak. Mr. Clark is renowned as a lawyer and civil rights crusader. He served as Attorney General for, of the United States for two years under Lyndon Johnson after holding several other positions in the Justice Department. He's worked on projects ranging from desegregation and housing discrimination to the abolishment of the death penalty and police brutality. He also co-authored the book Crime in America, The Role of the Supreme Court. Currently, he's working as a teacher and a private law practitioner. Uh, over the summer, he made headlines for his trip to Iran to try and help resolve the hostage crisis, and he's informed me that tomorrow he will be leaving for Angola to look at the problem of apartheid in southern Africa. I'd like to remind you that after his speech, there will be a question and answer session for the audience, and after the presentation, there will be a reception and cash bar in the lobby of this building. It's my honor and privilege to introduce to you all Mr. Ramsey Clark. Well, good evening. We've got these theater lights on. I can hear you there, but I can't really see you. Attorneys general are generalists, not military people, and generalists, as distinguished from specialists, are people who know less and less about more and more until they know nothing about everything. And I shall proceed to demonstrate my qualifications for the title generalist. The grand old 10 are 189 last December 15, the Bill of Rights. Or perhaps 189 young. Though on the other end, we are less than three years from 1984 and counting. Freedom, we've been told many times, is America's credo. And it's encapsulated primarily in the law where the crunch comes in our Bill of Rights. The history of the Bill of Rights for me is surely one of the most exciting histories in the story of human freedom. And I love history and do believe that it can help us understand from whence we come and even whither we tend. But rather than analyze the past, I want to try to look to the future with you because it's upon us. Hegel, in his treatise, The Philosophy of Right, suggested that right is freedom as idea, and that all of history is nothing but the expansion of that idea of freedom. 
<clears throat> Hegel is not one of my favorites, but I like to concede a point to the opposition now and then. I would suggest that the growth of freedom, rather than the somewhat quaint <clears throat> expression it's given in the Bill of Rights, is the most exciting thing about our experiment in government. We need to face <clears throat> actuality. We need to see the past as it was and the present as it is. When Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, he wasn't talking about Nat Turner, was he? Or even Mrs. Henry. <clears throat> the idea of freedom at that time, however bold and imaginative it may have been in the context <clears throat> of the culture, <clears throat> was small, constrained, and related primarily to power, to having my way. The most remarkable speech that I find in all of Lincoln's efforts was his sanitary fair speech in Baltimore in the spring of 64. <clears throat> it was less than two weeks after the Fort Pillow Massacre. And uh, we ought to remember the Fort Pillow Massacre. Where after <clears throat> months of painful debate, it was decided to commit blacks in Union uniforms to combat. And Nathan Bedford Forrest, who many think was the first head of the Ku Klux Klan, <clears throat> this poor historian among them, led an assault on the garrison at Fort Pilla in Tennessee. In which the entire black segment of the garrison was murdered. Forrest himself wrote that the Mississippi ran red for thousands of yards. And later congressional reports <coughs> carried stories of blacks being shot while on their knees, while standing in groups, while swimming in the river helpless, a slaughter. <clears throat> Lincoln had to try to confront the meaning of this when he came to Baltimore. He hadn't been to Baltimore <clears throat> since February of 1861, when he came through late at night on a train, many say in woman's clothing, literally. And the first Union soldiers that tried to move from Pennsylvania and Massachusetts through Baltimore got fired on <clears throat> because it was absolutely dangerous. And uh, Lieutenant Pinkerton urged him not to go through Baltimore at all, but he did, and now he came back. And he began his speech, a man <clears throat> in the midst of a bloody war, a civil war, and also an upcoming election with the military industrial complex running <clears throat> General McClellan against him, with this improbable sentence. The world has never had a good definition of the word liberty. And the American people 
just now are badly in want of one. He went on to say that all proclaim for liberty, <clears throat> but all do not mean the same thing when they use the word. And cited how very, very frequently Jefferson Davis <laughs> and many others speaking on the other side of the line proclaim themselves the true champions of liberty. <clears throat> the <clears throat> expansion of our idea of liberty from a very narrow and limited beginning. In the Bill of Rights, there are three ideas. And fewer than 33 illustrations all together <coughs> of the ideas. And they relate <coughs> only to limits on the power of government to affect the property or person of persons of citizens, like putting soldiers in their houses, <laughs> like searching their premises or persons, seizing their papers, like taking property for public purposes without paying just compensation, idea one. Idea two has to do with the elements of due process in the broader sense when the state confronts the individual in a criminal proceeding. The right to due process itself, <clears throat> whatever that may mean. The right to a jury. <clears throat> the right to the assistance of counsel, which 175 years later, more or less, um, was uh, discovered to mean that even a poor person uh, could have a lawyer when confronted with a felony charge. A lawyer wouldn't get paid much, nothing for investigation or anything like that, but nonetheless he could stand up there and if he felt like it, say something. And finally even in misdemeanors. <clears throat> and the third idea had to do with what I would call the spirit of humanity the right <clears throat> to be let alone, the right to think if you want to, doesn't make your head hurt too bad, the right to even speak, not necessarily say anything, <clears throat> the right to print, publish, the right to pray and worship, the right to have a conscience and to speak from it, believe from it, and act consistently with it. These were the ideas. By the time World War II was ravaging Western Europe, the beginning of 1940, Franklin Roosevelt expanded beyond those with his speech we call the Four Freedom Speech to include two new ones. Freedom from fear, a concern of that patrician for reasons no one's adequately analyzed over many years of his life, and freedom from want, also from a patrician who never personally experienced it. Today in America, in my judgment, <clears throat> the idea of freedom is far broader and more inclusive and more perfectly fulfilled than at any time in our history. 
And then there is also the paradox that freedom in all of its aspects was never so endangered. I need to discuss, before getting to what I really want to talk about, the indivisibility of freedom for a moment. Uh, too often, America has thought of freedom only as political freedom. That is a pathetically narrow vision. Thoreau's greatest essay, in my judgment, is one he entitled Life Without Principle. Beautiful to read. <clears throat> In it, he said, Take it as a given, if you will, that we have achieved political freedom from a tyrant. We are clearly still the slaves of an economic and moral tyranny. And in his value priorities, what after all is the purpose of political freedom but moral freedom? <clears throat> For the people of the United States, the only nation in history, Chesterton said, founded on principle, the principle being freedom, uh, to tell a billion starving and hungry human beings on earth suffering from malnutrition that the great writ of habeas corpus is all you need on earth <laughs> won't do. I say that as a person who spends uh, a great portion of his waking hours seeking writs of habeas corpus. Uh, but that great writ run to a bag of bones that can't stand up doesn't work. As the Grand Inquisitor said in that powerful scene in the Brothers K. the scene, the return of Christ to Inquisition Spain, the Inquisitor speaking of the people. Finally, they will come to us and throw their freedom at our feet and beg us, make us your slaves, but give us bread. Pinder wrote that culture is lord of everything, of mortals and immortals king. Bacon called culture the principal magistrate of life on earth. The capacity of the individual to see beyond the parameters of this narrow little culture which says worship sweet potatoes is very, very limited. And perhaps the most exciting struggle of humanity is the effort to expand the imagination to see beyond to something possibly better for children and all people. Mary Eastlick wrote one of the most compelling documents in American history in the last decade of the 17th century in the little town of Salem, Massachusetts. She was not yet 20. She had been convicted as a witch. Sam Adams' grandfather was past middle age and lived there. In the document possessed by the Massachusetts Historical Authority, is a letter Mary Eastlick wrote to the city council in which she 
pleaded not to be hung as a witch because she wasn't a witch and for the council to make this terrible mistake and hang her as one would only embolden the real witches and she named three <laughs> her friends and the letter did not prevail and she was not burned at the stake, but hung, as the Salem witches were. Cultural freedom involves respect for culture, but the ability objectively to analyze it and develop a stronger and better culture. And there can be little freedom without it. And the other elements of freedom that are indivisible that go on and on, but must all be considered. And now I want to look at the future. To me, human fulfillment <clears throat> is the flower of freedom. the possibility for the release of all of our individuality, of all of our imagination, of all of our difference, and all of its God-given beauty. Fulfillment is the flower of freedom, born of no other tree. And freedom is the child of mother courage. Now, we are building three nuclear bombs a day. William Webster, our director of the FBI, and I have to digress a minute to tell you a beautiful thing which just occurred to me. It's America as it ought to be. <clears throat> I was in Washington Saturday and I was going out to National Airport late in the afternoon to catch a plane to New York and I just, um, <clears throat> I was hustling through the airport, and here comes a guy with a no tie and an open shirt and a corduroy jacket, wasn't me, carrying two, I didn't, I wasn't looking at him, carrying two big old things, and he said, hi, Ramsey. <clears throat> and I glanced up, and he, he said, Bill Webster, the director of the FBI. I can remember a time when it was... <laughs> an armored car, <laughs> and I'm not kidding, <clears throat> and a flying wedge <laughs> with snap brim hats. Appearances can deceive, of course. I mean, we have seen Abscam. God help us. I don't like anything I've seen about it, but less than what I saw of ugly acts of members of the Congress, uh, for which I'm not responsible, were ugly acts of agents of the government which I am responsible for as a citizen in a society functioning under democratic institutions, setting them up. Look, if we can't do it uh, wide open, free and uninhibited, <laughs> there ain't much chance anyway. <clears throat> I believe 11 nations have the bomb. No one who studies the situation thinks fewer than 25 or 30 will have the bomb by the year 2000. This same William Webster, who I saw in the airport Saturday, just like plain old people, said a year ago in November that it's possible to go into the library of any college or university in America and obtain information from which you can build an atomic bomb that you can carry out on your back. Heard any comments lately about how we're not going to permit terrorism anymore? You know, there's a real world. There really is. <laughs> and a bunch of fatuous statements don't solve problems.
Fear is the ultimate tyrant. All through history, look back, what's caused it? <laughs> People aren't deprived of freedom simply because others have nothing to do with their excess energy and use it that way. It arises from the strife and the tension and the turbulence and the fear of the time, always. <laughs> War is a major culprit. If you look back through the history of the Bill of Rights, you'll find the major violations. All, when are the, when's habeas corpus suspended? In time of peace? When does it all happen? When do they haul Eugene V. Debs away to jail in Canton, Ohio? uttering it's a very dangerous thing to exercise the fundamental right of free speech in a world fighting to make uh, the globe safe for democracy. 1918, that's when. What do you do to save society from the bomb? How does freedom face it? I've been criticized for being so arbitrary, so ideological on the idea of freedom is to be impractical and to endanger freedom. As Attorney General, I oppose capital punishment, I oppose wiretapping, refuse to use it, all the rest, informers. <clears throat> but last fall I testified under subpoena from the government in the trial of two former high officials in the FBI. Mark Felt and Ed Miller. L. Patrick Gray was never brought to trial. He was the acting director. They were indicted for violation of fundamental human rights, breaking and entering into a private area, your home, a black bag job, they like to call it. No court warrants, nothing. You just go in there. It was the weatherman. There were women, too, but they weren't recognized, as has generally been the case. And their homes and privacy were invaded um, as efficiently as modern technology can. The government asked me the questions you would expect. Uh, while you were attorney general, did you authorize any black bag jobs? No. Did you hear of any? No. Were you ever asked to authorize one? Yes. Uh, what was that? You describe it. Did you do it? No. <clears throat> End of direct examination. Cross-examination. Mr. Clark, are there any circumstances under which you would authorize entry into a protected area, a home, without a warrant. Well, you want to be as absolutely true to what you think is possible. Freedom and other things are involved. What do you say? You always start with your own bias. I've never seen them in real life. I served in the department for eight years. I never saw one. But if you're asking me to exercise my imagination, hoping someone would object and the judge would say sustained, because after all, what a place does speculation have in a courtroom? Uh, yes, I can imagine a circumstance. Imagine it. I didn't say Des Moines, I could have, or Ames. I said the Big Apple. <clears throat> Take care of number one first. <clears throat> There's a bomb. Someone has just told you it's in that building, in the basement. It's a half a megaton. It can kill hundreds of thousands of people We think it might go off at any minute. 
the people who want to detonate it are acting now. The courts are closed or too far away. Okay, let's go. If we permit the future to confront us <laughs> with the fear of such choices, then freedom will be lost. Our capacity today to destroy has, in Faulkner's words, left only one question. <laughs> you remember his Nobel Prize speech, which he said, I'm just a farmer who likes to tell stories. And they're no longer questions of the spirit. The only question is, when will I be blown to bits? That sort of growing fear <laughs> caused, not irrationally, by a nuclear arms race, is more than freedom can stand. And those who want children to live and grow with psychological freedom <laughs> 